Hi Grace, it's Pastor Maddie. I am excited to be leading week three of four of our Sunday School series, Thin Spaces. For those who haven't joined us over the last couple of weeks, we have made a decision amongst the leaders of our adult education to have a common video lesson that all of our Sunday School classes discuss. And so you'll see the different Sunday School options we have. The first three are in person, so be sure to bring your mask and show up at 9.30 on Sunday mornings to um, connect in uh, either of these small group spaces. And just a warning, there, we're definitely in a season of flexibility as we figure out numbers and uh, people start to become more comfortable coming back. And so meet where you are intending to go and then your facilitator will, will lead you accordingly. I think the last, last week they all decided to join together. And so um, it's a bit of a flexible time, but we're glad to have the opportunity to gather in person in this way. And if you are on vacation or still not comfortable coming back in person, we still are hosting virtual Sunday school on Zoom. So that's another option for you. So this video is, again, the lesson that we are all discussing. And so I encourage you to watch it before this Sunday, the 16th. So I'd explained in week one this concept called thin spaces. And in Celtic Christianity, thin spaces were these places in the world where the Celts thought our world and God's world were, were blurred. There was a thinning of space and, and these were considered the holiest of places. And so some very natural uh, thin spaces for Celtic Christians were seen as mountaintops and bodies of water. These were just naturally seen as almost portals to God's world. And so we're taking this concept um, the, into the next step by looking a bit more at a piece of our mission statement, Grow in Grace. And we are using this framework you see on the screen now to figure out these thin spaces in our lives. Some are natural holy places and some are less uh, obvious, but these places help us to connect to uh, God's world and God's intention for us as God's creation to um, grow in grace and continue in our faith life. And so you'll see in this image that there are uh, four quadrants and they're defined by acts of piety and acts of mercy seen in both individual and communal ways. And so for the last two weeks, we've been focusing on the left side. So individual or individual and communal acts of piety, which I defined as what brings us closer to God. And so for today and the next week, we will be looking at the right quadrant, looking at acts of mercy, which I'm defining as what connects us or brings us closer to others as a reflection of God's love. And so we're looking at this in an individual and a communal way. So with acts of piety, the individual and communal distinctions felt pretty clear, but I will admit that I think the individual and communal acts of mercy are a little less clear and there um, there's a, an, a more connected relationship where sometimes they can look really similar or they can look like cause and effect um, and I think there's even an in-between of these individual and communal acts of mercy that we'll, we'll dive into a little bit later and so for today we will focus most on this third quadrant individual acts of mercy but before we do that, I wanted to kind of offer an image that will help us maybe distinguish between acts of mercy in an individual sense and acts of mercy in a communal sense. So I was taught this distinction with the image of a tree. And I will admit that I am the worst when it comes to any plant or gardening metaphor. So bear with me. I hope this image feels helpful. But I'm looking at a tree in a very simplistic way, but looking at it in three parts with the leaves, the trunk of the tree, and the roots of the tree. All are important and a very clear part of the tree, but distinct. And so taking this image and looking a bit more at our individual and communal acts of mercy, 
I see the leaves of the tree as comparable to individual acts of mercy, or another word being charity. And so some defining features of this would be, these are one-on-one -on -one interactions with our neighbors. These are interpersonal, and maybe another way to describe it. And these are more short-term actions. And we'll dive into some examples later, but to me, these feel um, part of the definition of what it means to engage in individual acts of mercy or charity. So now looking at the trunk of the tree, actually, just kidding, I am going to jump to the root of the tree. And so we're going to see individual acts of mercy, mercy with the leaves. And then the roots of the tree are seen as communal acts of mercy. And so I define these more um, as looking at the root of, of the problem, the root of an injustice, the root of why a community might not be thriving, similar to why the roots of the tree might reflect why a tree is not thriving. It's not always something we can can see, but you can see its effects in the trunk and in the leaves. And so justice is another term for this. So I see the leaves as charity or individual acts of mercy, and then the opposite being the roots or justice, communal acts of mercy. And so then there's the trunk, what connects these two? And I see this as education. And this is really essential for both parts of the tree. Education needs to um, equip us in our acts of mercy, help inform both our charity work and our justice work. And, and this to me reflects the giant tree of acts of mercy and it's all connected but distinct. And so, Another way to describe this, I've heard, is uh, looking at the very common uh, phrasing of if you give a man a fish, feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, feed him for life. And so taking this to our tree, I see the individual acts of mercy, so those interpersonal, one-on-one, -on -one, short-term fixes as giving a man a fish. If someone's hungry, give them food. That, that to me is a reflection of individual acts of mercy or charity. And so then taking it next step, we see the trunk of the tree as teaching a man to fish, education, uh, connecting this next step of it's not just giving a man a fish, but equipping them to feed themselves. And then, next step, this isn't a part of the <laughs> phrasing, but it is an important piece of the puzzle, is getting to the root of the fact this person is hungry. So some of those questions might be, you know, why are there no fish in the pond? Or why might the water be contaminated? Or why is the pond not near this man at all? Why does he have to travel so far to, to visit this pond? So these questions, um, I think, allude to the root of the problem, root, the root of the um, scenario. And so, again, they're all important pieces of it. Um, they're all connected. And, and they are distinct. And so today we are diving a little bit deeper into the individual acts of mercy, these short-term, interpersonal, one-on-one -on -one, uh, responses, a reflection of how we love our neighbor as a reflection of God's love. And so there are a lot of reasons why I think we are called to do this. And so looking biblically, we see in the early Israelite community in the Old Testament, there, there is this call to individual acts of mercy or charity. So welcome the stranger and, and feeding those in need in the, in the community. And looking to the prophets, we see that as well, but I'm going to focus on the prophets a little bit more next week. Um, but looking to Jesus' own life and ministry, I think we see so many examples of him engaging in individual acts of mercy, feeding the 5,000. There were people around him who were hungry and he fed them. That is an individual act of mercy. Um, when there were those in his midst who were sick, healing them, visiting them, that was another individual act of mercy. One of the most common uh, scriptures that we often come to is from the Gospel of Matthew, where we see Jesus describe in parable what the kingdom of heaven might look like, what we as a people of faith might be called to in order to grow closer to our neighbor. 
And uh, when he's describing this, he's saying, well, it's, you know, anytime you've cared for me, that's, that's been an individual act of mercy. And the disciples then ask, you know, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? So we see, like, when did we do any of these individual acts of mercy? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So Jesus is clear. Individual acts of mercy is a reflection of loving God. And, and that is, I think, an important way to see the connection of loving God, acts of piety, in how we love our neighbors. And so um, that's from Matthew 25. And again, our Bible is, is filled with examples of these individual acts of mercy. But also interestingly, historically, um, for us as people called Methodists, we have examples of the um, early Methodist movement being rooted in not just acts of piety, but acts of mercy as well. We've talked over the last couple of weeks about the ways that John Wesley and Charles Wesley and their friends would gather at Oxford and engage in a lot of really important individual and communal acts of piety. So last week we saw the questions for self-examination that they asked in community. Um, we saw that they took communion as often as they could. We saw them engage in prayer life and, and just really rich spirituality. So we see that as acts of piety. And it wasn't until their friend William Morgan, who was a man very convicted and engaged with acts of mercy, he came to the Wesley brothers and said, I think we need to integrate this into our life of holy living. And so William Morgan was the one who spawned them to do individual acts of mercy. So they visited debtors and felons in Castle Prison in Oxford. They visited elderly and the poor, and they also taught children within the community. And so Again, it used to be more central to do these acts of piety, but they realized that you need these acts of mercy too, and they really engaged with individual acts of mercy. And so we see both biblically and historically this importance of individual acts of mercy. So looking now to Grace UMC, what are the examples that we have of how we engage in interpersonal, in one-on-one, -on -one, and short-term solutions to supporting others, supporting our neighbors? And I think some examples that came to mind for me, Thursday night suppers. For years, this has been a really central program for Grace UMC, and especially over this last year in the pandemic, we've had an incredible group of volunteers who have given their time to engage in this individual act of mercy. And so we see with the to-go meals that we are supporting folks who are hungry, who, who could use some food, and this is a beautiful expression of that. So similarly, we have the Winfield Food Pantry, we have commodities. I see these as really important acts of mercy that many of our Grace members participate in. We have also our connection with Irving School. You see in the fall, we collect money for backpacks and school supplies. And then in Christmas time, we um, bring some some gifts to adopt a family, uh, different Irving families. This is a way of engaging in individual acts of mercy that many of us participate in. And then monthly, we have our above and beyond giving. We collect money for certain programs that um, this money is, is reflective of an individual act of mercy. And so these are just some examples I came up with. And I think more often than not, local churches tend to engage more in individual acts of mercy. And we'll talk a little bit more about the distinction between individual and communal acts next week. But um, we see a lot of our programs reflective of individual acts of mercy. And so as you might have gathered from this presentation, it, it doesn't seem as clear-cut as individual and communal acts of piety, but hopefully the examples and the imaging with the tree, with the scripture, with um, even our examples here at Grace UMC, hopefully you can get a sense of what some of these individual acts of mercy are around us and also what, what might engage you as well as you grow in grace as, as an individual and as part of Grace UMC. So, 
To round off our conversation, a few questions. So our first question, when it comes to individual mercy, what events or activities feel most resonant for you in your own faith life? Why? And that could be something you're engaged in currently, or that could be even something you've done in the past, or something you might want to look forward to. Next question. Local churches, as I mentioned, tend to offer many programs emphasizing individual mercy. Why do you think this is the case? And lastly, what ways might God be calling Grace UMC to grow in grace when it comes to individual mercy? So this could look like programs we already have, some that have been mentioned, or it could look uh, like different and new programs that maybe God is calling us to. Um, so again, individual acts of mercy are important, and it's a very important part of the tree. <laughs> and so it's important we engage in the conversation uh, as individuals. So hope this uh, gets you thinking, and we will see you Sunday.